You're listening to The Wild Initiative Podcast Network. Learn more and check out all the shows at thewildinitiative.com. You're listening to the Fish Untamed podcast, where we talk all things fishing, conservation, and the outdoors. Today on the show, I'm joined by Jacob Knight, Director of Business Development at Go Wild. All right, welcome to episode number 11 of the Fish Untamed podcast. Today I'm chatting with Jacob Knight, who is the Director of Business Development at Go Wild. Now, you may have heard me mention Go Wild at the end of my episodes, um, but if you're not familiar with Go Wild, it is essentially a social media platform geared toward outdoorsmen. Uh, Most people think of it as a hunting and fishing app, and I would say that the majority of people on there are hunters and anglers, but it also caters to uh, plenty of other outdoor activities, hiking, gardening, bird watching. Uh, If you can do it outside, there's a good chance that Go Wild uh, has a feature for you to use. Um, It's a little bit less followers based than a lot of other social media platforms. So instead of kind of measuring your success based on how many likes or followers you get, uh, instead you follow what they call trails, which are essentially different categories. So they've got trails for big game hunting, for small game hunting, for fly fishing, for bass fishing. Um, And you follow those trails instead. So instead of following a certain person and seeing what they specifically are up to, you can follow a trail and see what everyone is up to under that trail. So it's a really great way to cater to your own preferences in terms of what kind of subject matter you want to see. Uh, So if you're not yet on Go Wild, I would highly suggest downloading the app and giving it a try. Uh, So without further ado, here is my chat with Jacob Knight. Do you just want to start off then by telling me a little bit about your fishing background? Yeah. So I, you know, like most people, I began fishing, uh, going with my dad. And so he was big into fishing little farm ponds and stuff at the time. He didn't have a a boat or access to a boat when I was younger. And so it was a lot of just bank fishing at ponds. And a lot of those memories were catching a couple of fish or reeling in fish that he hooked or chasing frogs, catching crawdads. Uh, you know, just keeping myself busy and entertained while he fished. So, you know, that was my earliest memories were this little farm pond behind my grandparents' house. Yeah, and I I think that's where a lot of people got their start. And it sounds like you had the right kind of, um, you know, dad who's willing to let you just, you know, play around and be a kid, too. I feel like, you know, you hear those horror stories where someone's forced to sit in a boat for eight hours and, you know, fishing's like the lowest thing on their list of of activities so sounds like it it stuck for you yeah you know he was he was very mindful of that when I was younger and then when I got to be you know 10 11 12 somewhere around that age my grandfather had a lake house at the time and we had access to a boat and that was where you know it was I would go out with him for a little bit he would stay close enough that he could zip right back over to the boat you know the boat dock and let me off Mm -hmm. and so he was always pretty mindful of the situations he got me in and uh, what I was able to to do or kind of keep myself busy. So were you growing up in Kentucky or is Kentucky more of a recent move for you? Yep I grew up in here actually in Louisville and uh, my parents house is about five minutes from my house. I swore it off said I'd never come back and here I am. So, uh, yeah, I I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, moved to Lexington for a little bit for college and then work afterwards and then made my way back here after getting married. And so you took a bit of a hiatus from fishing, it sounds like, when you went to college? I did, yeah. And actually, it was more through high school and uh, kind of earlier college. Okay. Yeah. Um, and had you started fly fishing by that point? I know you said you didn't start with that, but um, kind of have transitioned mostly over to fly fishing at this point. Yeah, I would say I'm I'm probably probably about seventy five percent fly fishing at this point. 
And uh, a lot of that has to do because I still go fishing with my dad on, on his bass boat and mm-hmm. fishing deep lakes, fly fishing is sometimes nearly impossible or just not enjoyable for how hard it is. Um, but yeah, I didn't start fly fishing until I think I was probably a senior in college. And at the time, my boss was also an angler and just mentioned it one day and I started asking questions and it went from there. So when you took the the break kind of throughout high school and early college, is um, the desire to pick up a fly rod kind of what got you back into fishing? Or did you already started making that transition being like, I, you know, I miss, I miss it, grow, you know, growing up with it and everything. And then, you know, after you picked fishing back up, that's when you um, transitioned to fly fishing later. Yeah, so I got back into it when uh, just going with buddies. We would go sit by the river and just throw, like, <laughs> it was ridiculous. We'd take a cooler full of beer and some chicken livers and fish for catfish, and it was more about the social aspect than the actual fishing. Uh, I don't know that we ever actually caught fish. And then, so that was when I got back into actually buying a fishing rod, my own equipment. Uh, and then I started mountain biking and there was a mountain bike trail fairly close to my house that went right next to a little Creek and it just looked fishy. And I guess growing up fishing, I knew how to kind of assess environments and water and, uh, it just looked fishy. So I eventually went back over there with a a spinning rod and I don't even think I took a tackle box. I think it was just what the one small mouth lure that was on the rod Mm-hmm. and fished in, in that little creek and caught a bass and that that was it that was enough to get me back into it <laughs> and then I was hopping around to golf course ponds and everything at that point so what are you mostly fishing for are you mostly fishing for smallmouths these days or and what did you grow up fishing for yeah I grew up fishing for a lot of bluegill uh largemouth bass crappie and um most of the I would say most of the time I'm fishing for largemouth because my mother-in-law has a pond on her property that is it's a great little farm pond for bluegill and largemouth bass so majority of my time is spent fishing for warm water species but my ideal situation again is the fall winter early spring getting out to the trout streams that we have around here um you know if i've got two days to fish and I can get away for a weekend and go to Asheville, North Carolina, which is five hour drive. Um, you know, that's the kind of mountain fishing that I get to do. Mm -hmm. So are you catching uh, brook trout there? I assume. Uh, a lot of there's stocked brook trout. Okay. And when you get into the smokies, there's some of the wild brook trout, you know, the really pretty small fish. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of the time though, we're catching just, you know, 10 12 inch brown and rainbow trout okay the brook trout there it's crazy they get ginormous in a lot of the streams where they're stocked they're big and black they're not very pretty fish really yeah it's it's (laughs) kind of funny um but yeah the getting up into the smokies into the mountains you get some of the smaller pretty brook trout so is the the bass just because it's it's pretty convenient and local to you like you can just get out after work or or whatever and take a couple casts i assume it's pretty easy with the kids as well yeah, exactly. It's 14 minutes door to door. And so that's uh, the most access. And then there are, there's some other places where I'll go and stream fish for smallmouth. Um, and that, that's a lot of fun. I think if, if during the summertime chasing smallmouth and some of the creeks around here is, is a blast and sometimes even more fun than trout, but uh, that, you know, it just, it kind of depends. It's hit and miss. So what are you, are you fishing just standard streamers for smallmouth, I guess, or largemouth? Do you use uh, poppers or anything? Yep. Poppers, clousers. Uh, there's, you know, pretty good size helgramites and, and, you know, like stonefly type, just big black uh, streamers. And then I, I have used some of like the jointed, which you would, the, uh, the jointed flies that streamers that you would use for brown trout. Mm-hmm. I've tried some of that stuff with bass. I haven't had a ton of luck, but I know you can you can fish for them with that kind of stuff too. Yeah, it seems like bass are kind of just throw something, you know, large and in charge in front of them and, and pull it back fast enough that they can't resist. Yeah. I grew up with uh, smallmouth fishing as well, not not fly fishing for them. I still haven't caught 
uh, small mouth on the fly yet, but I can I can imagine you know how much fun I had as a kid on a spin rod with them that they've got to be a ton of fun on a fly rod. Yeah, and you know it's definitely in moving water too. That whole complexity. Uh, anytime you're fishing moving water, it's there's a complexity to it that makes the fight that much better. But the bass just pound for pound. You could have a, a largemouth bass that's twice as big as a smallmouth, but they are just mean. They they attack the fly like they're possessed, and they're just much madder than largemouth. So the, the fight and the fishing experience is a lot more fun. Yeah, I remember as a kid, so I grew up along like a smallmouth river, and you know, I've, I've since caught a handful of largemouths out of there and some of the, like, the slower pockets along the edges and stuff, but it's, you know, 99% smallmouths. And it took me until I was probably, you know, 12 or 13 before I actually had access to a lake that I could go catch largemouths in. And I was so excited because in my mind, I was like, lar- like, it's going to be a larger, you know, badder fish. And then I caught a couple and I was like, I think the smallmouths are better. You know, <laughs> they're just more fun. Yeah. They, the largemouth, they give you a couple of seconds and they just kind of go belly up. Yeah. All right, bring me in, get this over with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Are you get, do you ever catch anything else? Like what else is in these creeks? Do you ever, um, you know, I, you know, I would always catch, you know, walleyes as bycatch, um, growing up. Do you ever have anything like that? Or is it pretty much a, a smallmouth fishery entirely? Yeah, there's, uh, you get, um, what we would call warm mouth or rock bass. Mm-hmm. Um, and then of course the sunfish and bluegill from time to time. And there are carp. I, I haven't had much luck chasing or targeting carp. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's definitely a decent population of carp in the same streams too with the smallmouth. Yeah. It seems like, uh, carp are one of those ones that you have to really specifically target. Like you're not going to accidentally catch one when you're fishing for, for bass, but I I feel, yeah, I would see them. If anything, I walk up and spook them and they take off. That's usually when I see them. I never, I just, I guess I don't pay attention close enough to their, their form or their color. (laughs) And so I walk up and spook them all the time. Yeah. Do you, uh, are you mostly floating or wading? Uh, I love to wade fish. Okay. Yeah. I have a, I have a belly boat that I'll use in some smaller ponds and lakes around here. Um, but you know, it's, I've been in a drift boat a couple of times and I'm never going to turn down a drift boat trip, but I love being in the water with the fish and the wading. Yeah. Especially with the warm water species, you can go without waders. It's just it's a nicer experience, I think, than waiting for trout. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So tell me about fishing with your kids. Because I, from the form you filled out, it it sounded like you had one six-year-old, but then you just mentioned that you also have an infant. So <laughs> kind of different yeah, dynamic. I, I, yeah, I have three. So uh, six, three, and then five months. So it's, it's very busy around our house. Um, the... So the six-year-old is completely into fishing at this at this point for his, for our, what I think a six-year-old, and so he has been you know bait casting, spin fishing, and then this year he just all of a sudden was like, "Dad, I want to learn to fly fish." So of course I'm I'm giddy. I get out the little practice rod and take him out in the front yard and kind of teach him the casting stroke, and. Uh, the first time he got to f- fly fish in the pond, he said, I, I don't want a regular fish anymore. And it, <laughs> <laughs> it's so I, you know, I had to kind of tell him like, I get it, buddy. It's a lot of fun, but you don't always catch as many fish depending upon what you're doing. You know, don't, don't completely write off spin fishing. And um, so he's, he's pretty into it at this point. He has not caught a fish on the fly rod yet. So I am like anxiously awaiting that. I think more so than him to to see him do that. Did he say why he wants to switch? Is it just, you know, dad does it and I want to be like dad? Or is he bored with just like sitting there with a bobber? Like what's what's the motivation? So uh, he he thinks it's more fun. And I, it, which is interesting because he's, he's snagging the ground or he's snagging my jacket sleeve or, you know, he's he's just enjoying it more. And I think it is because it's different and because, because dad does it, he sees dad going on these, these trips that he doesn't get to go on. There's kind of an element uh, to that, but yeah, I think it's just something new. Yeah. He's maybe ahead of his time. I feel like 
you know, there's a lot of adults that are like, I, I just want something more. Like, I have fun casting and everything. We're, like, learning about it. And it sounds like he hit that, you know, about 20 years ahead of everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's kind of been a natural with casting to begin with. Uh, since he was probably three or four, he was able to throw a crankbait without hooks. He could throw a crankbait probably 50 yards or so. Or, or probably 50 feet, not 50 yards, about 50 feet. And um, smoothly, you know, he's no, you know, he wasn't snagging anything. He could throw it straight out in a straight line, bring it back, straight line again, bring it back. And then he's able to actually pick out lures, pick out spots on the pond and catch fish, which, I mean, I don't feel like I've really taught him. He's just kind of picked it up watching us do it, I guess. Well, that's what I was going to ask if he – um, kind of had like a natural inclination to pick up fishing or if you had, you know, I, I assume that, you know, as a, as an outdoorsman dad, you want your kids to be able to do things with you, but was it something that you kind of, you know, exposed him to on purpose or did he just naturally take to it? Yeah, it's, so my dad was probably the first person to put like one of the little kitty poles in his hand uh-huh. and teaching him how to cast and stuff. Um, and I really think it's been, going out on the boat with us and fishing, going to the ponds and it just becoming a, a special thing that he gets to do with dad and his pops. So um, I think that's really where a lot of it came from was just watching us and experiencing it with us. Now, what have you experienced fishing with an infant on your back or chest? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's, it's different. You, she, she was good at first and and then probably you know five ten minutes into it she starts getting a little fussy and you can't stop you have to keep moving so if if you're walking and moving she's good she doesn't get upset but as soon as you stop moving she starts to get a little fussy and and (laughs) crying so i was it's almost like i was trolling around the edge of the pond i would throw it out to the middle and be walking as i was (laughs) reeling it in just to keep moving to to keep her happy is the casting motion enough to keep her at bay or you have to be walking uh no you definitely have to be moving just <laughs> I, I could kind of bounce a little bit but you know the the rhythm of bringing in line and bouncing a baby is too much for me so it, walking was a lot easier fair enough do you have any uh tips for anyone who's like i really want to get my kid into it but i'm struggling to keep them entertained yeah i, I mean the the same tips that i've heard is is just keep it short keep your expectations set realistically um if you can go somewhere close to home or i've even taken trucks that my you know when my middle son he doesn't have as much interest in fishing and so we have other things for him to do if we Mm -hmm. go somewhere uh and you know having something that they can entertain themselves with even if it's just the worms or the minnows in the bucket um, that seems to be good enough to keep them entertained especially with having so two of them that can walk and go with me fishing the older son is pretty Mm self-sufficient and then that allows me to kind of cast and if I hook a fish then hand it to the the younger one so doing that kind of stuff too don't don't let yourself get frustrated because they they can't cast and they're getting hung up a lot of times they're happy to just play in the dirt and then when you hook a fish then you can hand them the rod yeah, it's really hard to find a kid who's not enthralled by, you know, catching crayfish and, you know, digging in the mud and stuff, but, or reeling in a fish. I think casting yep. just isn't in the cards for a lot of kids, but all the other, all the other aspects of fishing are, are pretty naturally entertaining, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And there's definitely times where we will, so at my mother in law's pond, the largemouth bass were overstocked. So we had to actually pull some out and, and eat them to just to get the population back in control. And so he's over there just playing with all the, every fish we would put in the cooler. He's over there, you know, poking them, playing with their eyes, doing all kinds of just whatever he wants to do to <laughs> investigate the fish. So it, he had a lot of fun doing that. Well, that's awesome. I've, I hope one day if I have kids that they're, uh, they're as into it as it sounds like your oldest is. That's awesome. You just gotta, you just gotta <laughs> put them in it, put them in the scenario, put them in the situation. They will entertain themselves. They'll figure it out. Uh, and you know, it's, Uh, any of my friends who do stuff like this with their kids it's all about just keeping them involved in it and taking them out and doing it and then just becomes habit 
they they just kind of they're very malleable they figure it out for sure and i i think too like there's a there's a part of me that's like well i don't want to have to you know take time out of my own fishing to to continually take knots out and this and that and it's like yeah at the end of the day though it's it's probably more rewarding to to watch them anyway and and see them get super excited about something that you know probably wouldn't mean that much to you at the end of the day like a, a single bluegill or something might make their entire week yeah well, and that's something I still have a lot of learning to do. I mean, the whole <laughs> the patience aspect of, you know, you're hung in a bush again. I have to untangle it again. <laughs> and, you know, the wind knots with fly fishing is he, <laughs> the last time we went, he came over to me and, you know, God bless him. He tried to figure it out himself. He tried for, I watched him kind of out of the corner of my eye. He tried untangling it himself for a long time, much longer than I would have expected. And then he eventually walks over with it. And he's like, dad, I got it. It's tangled. And this thing, it was around like four of the guides. <laughs> and <laughs> just picturing I, a six-year-old trying to tackle that on his own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was just over there, you know, squatting down, messing with it. But eventually I just took the leader. I had another leader. I took that one off and there was no way I was getting that undone. So is he using your rods or does he have a rod of his own? I've heard that, you know, there's not really a point to having a, a kid sized fly rod because, you know, you you need the length to actually get a cast out there. Um, and that kids can kind of just use adult adult gear. But do you let him use yours or have you got like a little beater one for him? Or Yeah, I've done both. <laughs> so I, I have let him use my good equipment um, with in a controlled environment. It was at the pond. So the worst thing he could do is drop it in the water. Then I could mm-hmm. still get to it. Um, now when we were on the stream, I take a pretty, you know, pretty inexpensive Cabela's just basic five weight rod. And then I overline it because the, it's, it's like a broomstick. It, there's not much sensitivity to it at all. It Mm -hmm. doesn't load well, but when I overline it, it actually seems to cast a lot better for him. Mm -hmm. And then I don't have to worry about him banging it on the, on the ground or the rocks or anything. Yeah, especially because I, I can't imagine he's, you know, taking 60-foot casts out there. Um, and overlined rods tend to do well on those short casts, like make, mm-hmm. make them very exciting and easy to do. So that probably works out well. Yep, yeah. And it, it definitely lets him feel the cast a little bit more too, trying to explain, uh, you know, the the action of loading the rod and what he's – should it feel it and that kind of stuff in the mm-hmm. casting stroke is a lot easier when it's overlined. That's a good tip because I there's a lot of people I feel like that get started and they understand um, the theory behind loading a rod, but they they still don't get the feel like they have to they have to watch it go behind them to see when it's um, fully straightened out. And mm-hmm. I think having one or if you're a beginner, maybe even two sizes overlined just so you can um, exaggerate the feel of that loading. Yeah, I think it's one of those scenarios, too, where we can get locked into the exact specifications of line that you're supposed to use with a rod Mm -hmm. and you're not supposed to get anything different or the manufacturer calls for one thing. So that's what you got to use. And you're not going to break anything by going up a couple line sizes to where it feels comfortable for you or till you get it. Like once you get it, then you can go, go down some, some line sizes, but it's, it's not like it's going to, it's not putting a different bullet into a gun. It's not going to explode in your face. So just experiment with it and and try something that may work better for you. Yeah. I don't want to call it personal preference because there definitely is, you know, a a standard of, of matching things up, but it kind of is in a sense, you know, if, if you like the way it feels, you know, one or two sizes over or under what it says, then, you know, why not use it? You know, just because they say you shouldn't, um, there's definitely, you know, purposes for, for both of those things, but um, if it's, if it feels good, I feel like that's, it's kind of like the confidence fly, um, theory where it's, you know, if, if you fish it well, then you're going to catch more fish on a fly that you don't fish well, just because you don't have as much confidence in it. And if the rod feels good in your hand, you're going to cast better, you know, even if it's, if it's not quote unquote, the right line size for yep. your rod. Yeah. And it's like any other tools or, you know, athletic, um, equipment the what you have and what you play with and what you use is better than anything that you're not out doing something with you know so it's like yeah. you have really good equipment but if you're not taking the initiative to go out and practice with it it's not going to make you a, a better caster or a, a better golfer to just have expensive stuff so you know just getting out with what you got is much more important and and better for you than having the good stuff for sure i couldn't agree more yep 
Do you want to transition over to talking a little bit about Go Wild? Sure. Maybe we can start by just talking about what it is, because I'm sure there's still a lot of people that don't know what it is, but should. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, a social media and activity tracking platform for outdoorsmen and women. Um, there's a lot of hunting, fishing, and you know, backpacking, camping, um, and just general outdoor content that's on there. And what is great about it is that you can tell the entire story of your outdoor life. And so for me, I can, I can have content on there that I'm putting out that is focused around fishing around taking my kids and around hiking with my family. But then I can also, I can um, log the hunting that I did with my brother-in-law when he's getting his first deer. And so it, it's not, it's not specific to one activity and it's not specific to one season. So the, the awesome thing about it is that it kind of lives throughout the year uh, and you can, you can tell your story about what you're doing in the outdoors throughout the entire season and year. Yeah. It's more of a, I would say it's more log based than, you know, it's a traditional like post based mm -hmm. um, social media platform. You can, you know, they are posts and you can you can list things that aren't an activity you did like you can list a question or or any other thing that would be called a, a traditional post but it's more of a um here's what i've been up to here's how long i've been doing it um and and you can send it to i think they call them trails right mm -hmm. yep so um you you can say you know i've been fishing and anyone who is following the fishing trail will see that so it's not it's not as much based on who you're following but what you're following exactly yeah and if there's stuff that you're not interested in and you don't care um it's been kind of nice because in pitching it to my friends and family i can say look and this is graphic but it's not just bloody deer pictures if you have zero interest in hunting and you don't want to see any of that just follow the other stuff, follow the camping, the hiking, fishing, and, you know, you don't have to see that content. And that's what I like about it because it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't just like, like pigeon you hole into everything. You can kind of select from the, the stuff that you want to see. Yeah. And, um, I, I kind of wish that more people that weren't into hunting and fishing were on it. So like, I, you know, I got into it because it, I kept hearing about it on like hunting podcasts and stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, it took me a while to get into it, but now I like it a lot. Like, I like it, and especially with some of the newer features that have come out, um, it has become a much more used platform on my end for sure. Uh, but I wish that it didn't always have the view of being just a hunting and fishing platform because, you know, I log my ski days on there. Um, they've got, you know, bird watching trails and do it yourself trails. And um, there's a lot of stuff on there for people that have never picked up a fly rod or a, a rifle in their lives uh but be, i think a lot of people have the um impression that it's all for hunting and fishing so i'm hoping to see it kind of branch out more not that go wild needs to branch out more but i wish more people would um give it a chance i guess to to um you know log some of their non-hunting and fishing activities as well yeah and what's crazy i don't know the exact percentage i can't remember it but i, I know it's like 89 or 90 percent or something like that of all the members associate with fishing in some way but at the same time i don't feel like there's a ton of fly angling uh, or fly anglers that are in the app and so i see that as a, a potential growth spot for us and what's interesting to me is figuring out how we go about attracting those users so what could we have or what are they not seeing to make them stay if they have come in so somebody who is into backcountry camping and backpacking, what do we need? What would we have that would help get them into the app and get them more active and have this be a community that they want to participate in? Yeah, I'd agree. I've seen you know a ton of fishing content on there, but uh, I tend to recognize the names that are, are fly fishermen because there's few enough of them that it's like if you go into the fly fishing trail, you see the same people over and over again. Like it might be the same person has posted the last six, you know, log entries because no one else is, is up to anything. I wonder yeah. if that has anything to do with the fact that, you know, I said that Go Wild tends to be, I think, perceived more as a hunting and fishing platform. But if I had to peg it as just, you know, one thing, I would say that I view it as a hunting platform 
just because I think it caters to hunters. Hunters, I think, receive a little bit more uh, trouble on other platforms, whereas fishermen don't. So I think there's more of an incentive for hunters to to switch over from something like Instagram, where they may be getting their photos blocked or something like that, whereas fishermen don't have that issue. Um, And I wonder if a lot more of the hunting crowd involves uh, just traditional spin fishermen um, versus I, I know a lot of fly fishermen that don't hunt. And I don't know mm-hmm. a lot of uh, just spin fishermen that don't hunt. So I wonder if that is is part of what leads to there being more um, just overall fishing versus fly fishing. Or it could just be that there's way more people who, who spin fish than fly fish. But I have noticed that as well. Yeah, I think if, if you're looking at just the general population, there's going to be a whole lot more spin fishermen um, than fly fishermen. But then, you know, the other thing, <laughs> I guess, like how many... Um, how many of the generalizations about fly fishing can we make in one sentence? But <laughs> there's a, there's still a large older population that is fly anglers. And so, you know, there's that that we would be competing with, but then there's also the whole grip and grin thing. And a lot of social media um, kind of has that bad taste where fly anglers don't want to see the grip and grin because they, for right or wrong seem to think that the they have it nailed down for the exact way to hold a fish and treat a fish and everything and will judge people for doing it the wrong way and so i think there's i think that puts some people off from social media um or at least posting uh in the same way that hunting does so while yes i agree 100 percent that hunters have a, a better benefit or more of a benefit coming to something like a platform like go wild I think there is some of the angling side too that people just don't want to be blasted when they, you know, post something that they're proud of. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed that the the type of people on there it's it's different a different kind of crowd than you find on other platforms. And I don't mean just they hunt and other people don't or something like that, but uh, everybody is very supportive. And I wonder if it, that partly stems from the fact that there's almost a mentality that we've all left the other platform together like we're all in the same boat here um because i you know if if i am interacting with somebody on let's say instagram i don't really feel much of a connection to them you know it's it's just Mm -hmm. another name on the platform but on go wild you know i see the same names over and over again and i feel like i've gotten to, to to know some of these people um i sent some flies over to a guy i met on go wild and he sent me some some tail mounts for for a grass i shot so it's like there's just much more of a community atmosphere i feel like on there and as much as there there's definitely been photos on there i've seen that i've thought like that's not very tasteful i don't have the same just sour reaction to it because i assume that this person is you know you remember that they're actually a person you know it's Mm -hmm. it's not just hiding behind a a nameless profile yeah and i think the the big thing is that we're all all on there because we want to share the experience and share the uh, the education that we've gotten in the outdoors mm-hmm. and you can definitely see that when people are posting things and, and i actually mentioned this the other day i told our team i said look i love that people will come into our app and be just as prideful and proud of a spike buck or a small doe as they are of like a boone and crockett sized deer you know it's there there's a place for every experience level level there's a place for you to come in and share you know where you are in in your outdoor career or lifestyle and that it's acceptable and to me like that's what's important that's what brings more people into the sports that we love and that's where i think we have a great opportunity is to continue to show people like hey this is a learning environment this is an experiential environment. We're all out here trying to enjoy the same things. Let's help each other get better. Let's give tips. Um, and to me, like th- that's the great thing about it. Is it's, it's just such a an informative and open place. Do you want to talk real quickly about the uh, the trophy system on there? Since I think that kind of goes along with what you just mentioned about you know people aren't afraid to to post their their first spike buck because it's you know the best thing that's ever happened to them and there's not that that need to only share like the biggest and best things yeah so 
the and I don't know all the intricate details of how Zach, our data scientist, has set up the you know the scoring algorithm and everything, mm -hmm. but you know it, there is a there's a difficulty component to scoring an animal, or you know a trophy, a fish, in the method of whether you use a, a bow or a shotgun or a rifle, or whether you used a spin caster or a fly rod. All of that gets calculated into uh, the scoring of the trophy, and so it's not, you know, the the measurement of the antler width or the score that it gets on Boone and Crockett doesn't matter. It's more about, um, you know, just the the type of animal and how you went about getting it. Yeah, just to clarify, the the scoring it's not like a competitive. Um scoring system it's not like you're trying to out compete other people for the, the the highest score on any given animal it's just kind of a way to um you can view someone's profile and see how many points they have and you can generally assume that someone who has a lot of points has um had a lot of experiences outside like they'd, they'd be a good um person to, to talk to about a given subject um yeah yeah and the, the score is not related to followers it has nothing to do with the amount of people that follow you or like or content it has more to do with demonstrating that you have that experience yeah and points are also it's not just from animals you've caught or harvested it's also you know time you've spent so you get points if you you know cook a, a new dinner you know a new recipe or something like that or you you know do a diy gardening project like those will give you points as well um but you could go on to someone's profile who you know, talks about being really into archery or something and see that they've got, you know, a ton of points from archery. So if you have any questions about archery, you could reach out to that person. And it's it's a very uh, welcoming platform for questions, especially with the new gearbox. Do you want to talk about the gearbox function that was just added? Yeah. So as you're kind of leading into that, that's the, the great point is that while you can assess how skilled someone is in a sport, then you can also see that the gear that they are using on their gearbox and kind of make the uh, the assessment from there of, okay, this person seems to be a very accomplished archery hunter. And so checking out the gear that they used in their gearbox, you kind of, from there, you can kind of garner that the gear that they're using is for very strong archery hunters. Or, um, you know, maybe it's a super, you know, a very pricey bow that they use, but maybe you just know, okay, well, that must be a reputable brand. Uh, and so you can start looking into the other bows by that manufacturer. And so you can really change the way that you go about looking for gear um, and doing the entire shopping process for gear. So you're not just left to what I tell people is like the five star reviews that you see on Amazon or other e-commerce platforms. Um, they're just, sometimes just very irrelevant it could be someone that said i bought this for my grandson and he loves it and gives it a five-star review which means nothing's not helpful to you but the reviews and input coming from go wild is from hands-on users that you can look and see how much time they're spending outdoors you can look and see how much they're actually shooting their bow uh, you can look and see how much time they're spending fishing and from that, you can assess how much their credibility is on the gear that they're using. Right. And like I said before, there's there's a high rate of engagement on there. Um, and before the Gearbox feature was uh, implemented, I had gone on there several times and asked people's opinions on a certain type of gear. You know, when I was getting into archery, I was asking about bow brands and stuff. And this just kind of makes it a little bit easier because people can share um the actual piece of gear it's not just you know a written word they can send me the equivalent of like a go wild link to that piece of gear um or i don't even have to go on and explicitly ask it but i can go and be like okay these are the three names i keep seeing pop up in the you know whatever thread i'm gonna go look at what they have logged in their setup because you can you can make setups um so I have like a trout fishing setup. So anyone can come on and see, you know, which pieces of gear I use for trout fishing and don't have to throw a question out into the wind and hope that someone sees it. Right. Yeah. And, and it, uh, two, when you start engaging with somebody and you know, definitely they're giving you advice on one piece of equipment, then you trust them and you know to go back later and, and kind of see what other stuff they're using too. And you don't have to feel weird about, well, what was that that they said or I don't want to ask them about what kind of fly line they use too. So I'm going to go just check out their setup and see if I can see it. So they, it definitely makes it 
uh, just a, a more welcoming conversation about this stuff. Mm -hmm. So what do you do as a director of business? Is it director of business development? Yep. What, what does that entail? So I am talking with the brands and working with the brands that we're looking to partner with in the app. And so, you know, you'll see stuff in there from First Light and Polaris Adventures uh, and the Arcus brand. So Obsession Bows and Ramcat Broadheads. And so my time is working with those brands and um, there's there's ads within the app. But then you also will see the giveaways, the sweepstakes, and some of those things that we do. So I'm working with those brands to, to get all that stuff out there for the members. Okay. Um, one thing I probably should have asked before we got to that um, was something that you had mentioned you wanted to talk about, and that was the uh, elitist nature of fly fishing and how we can try to get off that high horse and be a little <laughs> bit more welcoming to people. Yeah, and, and so we've kind of had previous conversations through email and stuff about uh, you know, just beginners and getting people into fly fishing. Um, and I think the biggest thing for me going back to something I said earlier is that whole using the gear that you have kind of mentality mm -hmm. is don't worry about having the exact right things. Or uh, if, you know, when I started out, it was an old, it probably like if you bought it brand new today, I think the rods are $35. It's a, a yellow Eagle claw, seven weight fiberglass rod. I've got that rod sitting right next to this table right now. Yep, yeah. I'm looking at it. <laughs> that is an awesome bass rod. So <laughs> if you want to chase some more smallmouth, like that's a fun little, you know, goofy popper rod. I, I love that thing. So that's yeah, awesome. like, like to me, and, and then it was this really, again, it probably cost 35 bucks back then, but of, uh, it was a Fluger Metalist fly reel. And now they remade them and started charging 120 bucks for them, which I don't understand. But, uh, you know, it's like whatever you can get your hands on. It doesn't matter if it's by Orvis or Sage or one of the best companies out there right now. What matters is it's a fly rod that is in your hand that you can go out and just practice with, even if it's just in the yard, just get out and learn with something. And so I've had, you know, when buddies and friends find out that I'm a fly fisherman, they instantly, they instantly picture a river runs through it and I'm Brad Pitt, like just out there waving a fly, fly line around. And they, it just kind of gives off this, how do they just assess this elite mentality to it or um, that they just can't do it. And so like, I just want people to understand that the barrier to entry in fly fishing is what you make it. There's, there's nothing out there that is any different from getting into spin fishing other than the equipment. Mm -hmm. You want to catch fish, this is a way to catch fish. You want to try something new, well, this is definitely a way to try something new. And, I mean, I can't speak for every fly fisherman or fly angler out there, but it's, I would love for someone to ask me questions about it. And so there's a, a buddy who I've kind of committed to teaching him how to do it. I haven't done it yet, but um, like we have this a rolling date that we're going to try to get together and, and do it. But I, I'm excited about that because I want to see somebody else get into it. I got my, mm. my dad, I got my wife, and now my six-year-old. And those that that's way more important to me than the fish I catch is getting other people to try it getting other people to love it and just breaking down the barrier of you have to be someone that's the prettiest best caster on earth and you have to have a thousand dollar rod and you know this all this crazy expensive equipment that's just not what it's about i think that that's the common thread i hear from people is that they like they want to teach other people um and what i've noticed is i the only time that i don't find myself enjoying working with somebody else is when I can tell that they're not that into it. You know, like if, if they kind of express a mild interest and I convince them that it would be a fun thing to do and they're just, they're not really listening. They're just kind of going through the motions. I start to lose interest really quickly. But if I've got someone who is like stopping me to, you know, clarify three things I just said because they want to know more, that's, that's one of those people where I'm like, okay, we're going to stay out here all day. Like we're going to mm -hmm. learn everything because it's so fun to interact with someone who's got that, that, beginner's level of you know intrigue that 
like we don't really have the benefit of of getting to experience that anymore because we've been doing it so long so i think i think there's a lot of people in the same boat that would would love to help someone new uh, especially if that person is really excited to learn yeah and that's like from our perspective too learning how to teach someone's very different too than from you know the self-teaching or however you learned it Mm -hmm. it's uh you you almost kind of have to rethink the things that you've taken for granted just oh doing yeah it, trying to explain it to a six-year-old <laughs> and so you know it's it's crazy like all right wait am i thinking about this cast the right way like am, and then so you have to kind of decompo- decompose it and come up with the best way to explain it to them and so it's good for me like it's made me better at some of the things like reading water reading water and line control on moving water is where he's struggling right now and so i'm having to learn better about that so that then i can turn around and convey it to somebody else so any fly angler that thinks they're too good should try to teach a six-year-old uh (laughs) how to do it (laughs) and then see where their gaps are i i think you're right in that um i didn't realize how hard it was to explain fishy water to somebody until i tried to do it for the first time um i've I used to to guide a little bit, and um, it was mostly like beginner stuff. It was a lot of teaching people, not really guiding experienced anglers. Um, and it was mostly we'd mostly take people to lakes for the first time for obvious reasons. And it wasn't until I started teaching people more on streams that I was like, I have no idea how to explain that. I can t- I can tell you where all the fish are going to be, but I can't tell you why. And it took a long time of doing it before I could. I could explain why a fish would be, and I'm not talking about a basic thing. Like there's a rock there, there's a fish behind it because, you know, it's easier for them to hang out there, but you know, you can just see like seams and you're like, I know exactly where a fish is going to be sitting in that seam, but how to convey that to somebody who doesn't just see it Yep, is hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, some of the line control with your, you know, your, your off hand, not the rod hand, mm-hmm. some of that stuff you kind of just do naturally and you don't even think about, but having to explain some, to someone like how to control that line, where to hold it, where to keep pressure on, on the line, on the rod, all those things that we just do second nature that you wouldn't even think about unless you're trying to explain it to somebody. Mm-hmm. And you made a good point too about the, the gear, like the gear that you have is the, is the gear that you should use. Um, I was just talking to my boyfriend the other day about this because he, I, we had been talking about fly line qualities and you know, I don't, I don't have, like, I'm not very much of a gear junkie. I don't have very nice stuff. Um, and I still have some of the original lines that I got with my reels and I just haven't bothered to change them out yet. And he was asking like, what makes a, a good fly line better than a bad fly line? And I was talking about some of the, you know, qualities that you're supposed to get with a, a better fly line. But I was like, honestly, you know, if you learn to cast with a bad fly line, you're going to be great with a good fly line. So, you know, starting off with the with the best stuff you can get might actually work to your disadvantage just because you you can rely on that gear a little bit more. But if you learn to cast really well, like if you can catch fish on just a crappy little, you know, $50 fly rod, then imagine what you're going to do when you actually do, you know, pay the 800 bucks to get the nicest fly rod out there, you know? Yep. So. Yeah, that's... Uh... You know, it's, again, I kind of take for granted what I use. You know, I complain every once in a while, I complain about, oh, I need to get a new fly rod. That one's just, you know, it's it's older. And but (laughs) and then I try casting my sons. I'm like, nope, not going back to that. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, yeah, you definitely, and again, like anything else, as soon as you move up to something else, you're going to, quote unquote outgrow that at some point too and think you need to upgrade and so if you can learn on the cheapest then you know work yourself up well that's maybe that's a strategy just never upgrade i mean you'll never know what it's like yeah. it's like <laughs> if you never yeah. ate junk food you couldn't crave junk food if you never tried you never it. had electricity you never <laughs> right. know what electricity is like <laughs> awesome well do you want to share um where people can either find or follow you or go wild yeah, so definitely on Go Wild, Jacob Knight with a K. Um, that's the the best place to find me. I'm on Instagram as well, Jacob Knight 24. I have I've gotten a little lazy on my posting there, um, but you know that's you'll get family photos and stuff a lot more in there too. But yeah, and you can also shoot me an email, Jacob at Time to Go Wild. 
I'm happy to connect, tell you more about Go Wild, or for goodness sakes, answer some fly fishing questions, get me down <laughs> a rabbit hole doing that. So I'm, I'm right. here to help. You heard it here. Everyone send your fly fishing questions straight to Jacob. Bring it on. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for spending the evening with me. I really appreciate it. And I hope that uh, see a lot more people coming to Go Wild soon. Absolutely. All right. Take care, Jacob. All right. Thanks. See ya. All right, and that'll do it. As always, if you liked what you heard, go ahead and go over to the Wild Initiative podcast. You can subscribe there and get my shows every Thursday, as well as all of Sam's other shows throughout the week. You can also find my episodes over on fishuntamed.com, in addition to weekly backcountry fly fishing articles. And you can find me on social media under my name, Katie Burgert, on Go Wild or at Fish Untamed on Instagram. And I will see you all same time, same place next week.